Welcome to edupediaworld.com. This is Somja J. Naya, your online biology tutor. In this video, we are going to discuss about the chapter Organisms and Populations. What is Ecology? Ecology is a subject which studies the interactions among organisms and between the organism and its physical environment, that is the abiotic environment. Ecology is basically concerned with four levels of biological organization organisms, populations, communities, and biomes. In this chapter, we are going to discuss about ecology at organismic and population level. Organism and its environment. Ecology at the organismic level is essentially physiological ecology which tries to understand how different organisms are adapted to the environment in terms of not only survival but also reproduction. You may have learned in earlier classes how the rotation of a planet around the sun and the tilt of its axis cause annual variations in the intensity and duration of temperature resulting in distinct seasons. These variations together with annual variation in precipitation. This uh, precipitation include both rain and snow account for the formation of major biomes such as desert, rainforest and tundra. In this graph, you can see the biome distribution with respect to annual temperature and precipitation. Here you can see that the various biomes are arranged according to the annual temperature and annual precipitation. Biomes Biomes are very large ecological areas on the earth's surface with fauna and flora that is the animals and planets adopting to their environment. Biomes are often defined by abiotic factors such as climate, relief, geology, soils and vegetation. A biome is not an ecosystem although in a way it can look like a massive ecosystem. Regional and local variations within each biome lead to the formation of a wide variety of habitats. On planet Earth, life exists not just in a few favorable habitats, but even in extreme and harsh habitats. Scorching Rajasthan Desert, especially rains of Meghalaya forests, deep ocean trenches, to torrential streams, permafrost polar regions, high mountain tops, boiling thermal springs, stinging composite pits to name a few. Even our intestine is a unique habitat for hundreds of species of microbes. Types of biome. The desert biomes. They are the hot and dry desert, semi-arid desert, coastal deserts and cold desert. The aquatic biomes. Aquatic biomes are grouped into two. Freshwater biomes, lakes and ponds, rivers and streams and wetlands and marine biomes that are oceans, coral leaves and estuaries. Then the forest biomes. There are three main biomes that make up forest biomes. These are the tropical rainforest, temperate rainforest, boreal forest also called taiga. The grassland biomes. These are two main types of grassland biomes. The savanna grasslands and the temperate grasslands. Then the tundra biomes. There are two major tundra biomes, the arctic tundra and the alpine tundra. These are the major biomes of India. The first one is the tropical rainforest, the second one deciduous forest, the third one desert and the fourth one sea. What are the key elements that lead to so much variations in the physical and chemical conditions of different habitats? The most important ones are temperature, water, light and soil. We must remember that the physicochemical that is the abiotic components alone do not characterize the habitat of an organism completely. The habitat includes biotic components also like pathogen, parasites, predators and competitors of organism with which they interact constantly. We assume that over a period of time the organism has through natural selection evolved adaptations to optimize its survival and reproduction in its habitat. Abiotic factor, the temperature. 
Temperature is the most ecologically relevant environmental factor. You are aware that the average temperature on land varies seasonally, decreases progressively from the equator towards the poles and from plains to the mountain tops. It ranges from sub-zero levels in polar areas and high altitudes to greater than 50 degrees Celsius in tropical deserts in summer. There are however unique habitats such as thermal springs and deep sea hydrothermal vents where average temperature exceeded 100 degrees Celsius. It is a general knowledge that mango trees do not and cannot grow in temperate countries like Canada and Germany. Snow leopards are not found in Kerala forests and tuna fish are rarely caught beyond tropical latitudes in the ocean. You can readily appreciate the significance of temperature to living organisms when you realize that it affects the kinetics of the enzyme and through it the basal metabolism, activity and other physiological functions of the organism. A few organisms can tolerate and thrive in a wide range of temperatures. They are called eurythermal. But a vast majority of them are restricted to a narrow range of temperatures. Such organisms are called stenothermal. The levels of thermal tolerance of different species determine to a large extent their geographical distribution. The second abiotic factor, water. Next to temperature, water is the most important factor influencing the life of organisms. In fact, life on earth originated in water and is unsustainable without water. Its availability is so limited in desert that only special adaptations make it possible to live there. The productivity and distribution of plants is also heavily depend on water. Now you might think that organisms living in oceans, lakes and rivers should not face any water related problem. But it is not true. For aquatic organisms, the quality that is the chemical composition and pH of the water become very important. The salt concentration that is measured as the salinity in parts per thousand is less than 5% in inland waters. 30 to 35 percent in the sea and greater than 100 percent in some hypersaline lagoons. Some organisms are tolerant of a wide range of salinities. They are called urihaline, but others are restricted to narrow range, stenohaline. Many freshwater animals cannot live for long in a sea and water and vice versa because of the osmotic problems they would face. The third abiotic factor, light. Since plants produce food through photosynthesis, a process which is only possible when sunlight is available as a source of energy, we can quickly understand the importance of light for living organisms, particularly autotrophs. Many species of small plants like herbs and shrubs growing in forests are adapted to photosynthesis optimally under very low light conditions because they are constantly overshadowed by tall and canopied trees. Many plants are also dependent on sunlight to meet their photoperiodic requirement for flowering. For many animals too, light is very important in that they use diurnal and seasonal variations in light intensity and duration that is the photoperiod as the cue for timing their foraging, reproductive and migratory activities. The availability of light on land is closely linked that with that of temperature since the sun is source of both. But in the deep that is greater than 500 meter in the oceans, the environment is very dark and its inhabitants are not aware of the existence of any celestial source of energy called the sun. So what is the source of energy there? The spectral quality of solar radiation is also important for life. The UV component of the spectrum is very harmful to many organisms, while not all color components of the visible spectrum are available for marine planets living at different depths of the ocean. Last abiotic factor, soil. The nature and properties of soil in different places vary. It is dependent on climate, the weathering processes, whether soil is transported or sedimentary or how soil development occurred. Various characteristics of the soil such as soil composition, grain size and aggregation determine the pre-collation and water holding capacity of the soil. These characteristics 
along with parameters such as pH, mineral composition and topography determine to a large extent that the vegetation is in a, that area. This in turn dictates the type of animals that can be supported by that condition. Similarly, in the aquatic environment, the sediment characteristics often determine the type of benthic animals that can thrive there. Responses to abiotic factors Having realized that the abiotic conditions of many habitats may vary drastically in time, we now ask how do the organisms living in such habitat cope or manage with stressful conditions? During the course of millions of years of their existence, many species would have evolved a relatively constant internal, that is within the body, environment that permits all biochemical re reactions and physiological functions to proceed with maximal efficiency and thus enhance the overall fitness of the species. This constancy, for example, could be in terms of optimal temperature and osmotic concentration of the body fluid. Ideally then, the organism should try to maintain the constancy of its internal environment, that is called homeostasis. Despite varying external environmental conditions that tend to upset its homeostasis, let us take an analogy to clarify this important concept. Suppose a person is able to perform his or her best when the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and wishes to maintain it. So even when it is scorching hot or freezing cold outside, it could be achieved at home in the car while traveling and at the workplace by using an air conditioner in summer and heater in winter then his or her performance would be always maximal regardless of the weather around him or her. Here the person's homeostasis is accomplished not through physiological but by artificial means. How do the other living organisms cope up with the varying situations? The first one is regulate. Some organisms are able to maintain homeostasis by physiological, sometimes behavioral also means which ensures constant body temperature, constant osmotic concentration etc. All birds and mammals and a very few lower vertebrate and invertebrate species are indeed capable of such regulation that is thermoregulation and osmoregulation. Evolutionary biologists believe that the success of mammals is largely due to their ability to maintain a constant body temperature and thrive whether they live in Antarctica or in Sahara Desert. The mechanisms used by most mammals to regulate their body temperature are similar to the ones that we humans use. We maintain a constant body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. In summer, when outside temperature is more than our body temperature, we sweat profusely. The resulting evaporative cooling, similar to what happened with the desert cooler in operation, brings down the body temperature. In winter, when the temperature is much lower than 37 degrees Celsius, we start to shiver a kind of exercise which produces heat and raises body temperature. Plants on the other hand do not have such mechanisms to maintain the internal temperature. The second one, conform. An overlapping majority, that is 99% of animals and nearly all planets cannot maintain a constant internal environment. Their body temperature changes with ambient temperature. In aquatic animals, the osmotic concentration of the body fluid changes with that of ambient water osmotic concentration. These animals and plants are called conformers. Third one, migrate. The organism can move away temporarily from stressful habitat to a more hospitable area and return when the stressful period is over. Many animals, particularly birds, during winter undertake long distance migrations to more hospitable areas. Every winter, the famous Kelado National Park in Bharatpur in Rajasthan hosts thousands of migratory birds coming from Siberia and other extremely cold northern regions. Suspend. In bacteria, fungi and lower plants, various kinds of thick-walled spores are formed which help them to survive the unfavorable conditions. These germinate on availability of suitable environment. In higher plants, Seeds and some other vegetative reproductive structures serve as means to tide over periods of stress besides helping in dispersal. They germinate to form new plants under favorable moisture and temperature conditions. They do so by reducing their metabolic activity and going into a date of dormancy. 
in animals the organism if unable to migrate might avoid the stress by escaping in time the familiar case of bears going into hibernation during winter is an example of escape in time some snails and fish go into estivation to avoid summer related problems heat and desiccation under favorable condition many zooplankton species in lakes and ponds are known to enter their first stage of suspended development adaptations while considering the various alternatives available to organisms for coping with extremes in their environment we have seen that some are able to respond through certain physiological adjustments while other do so behaviorally that is migrating temporarily to a less stressful habitat these responses are also actually their adaptations so we can say that adaptation in any attribute of an organism that is morphological physiological behavioral that enables the organism to survive and reproduce in its habitat many adaptations have evolved over a long evolutionary time and are genetically fixed in the absence of an external source of water the kangaroo rat in north america desert is capable of meeting all its water requirement through its internal fat oxidation in which water is a by product it also has ability to concentrate its urine so that the minimal volume of water is used to remove excreted product this is a very good example for adaptation how desert plants are get adjusted to the extreme conditions in the desert many desert plants have a thick cuticle on their leaf surface and have their stomata arranged in deep pits to minimize water loss through transpiration they also have a special photosynthetic pathway called cam pathway that enables their stomata to remain closed during daytime some desert plants like opuntia have no leaves they are reduced to spines and the photosynthetic function is taken over by the flattened stems here you can see the picture of opuntia how mammals living in cold climate are get adjusted to that extreme cold condition mammals from the colder climate generally have shorter ears and limbs to minimize the heat loss this is called allen's rule in the polar seas aquatic mammals like seals have a thick layer of fat that is blah blah below their skin that acts as an insulator and reduces the loss of body heat this is how the mammals in the colder region maintain and adapt to the situation here you can see the picture of arctic seals which have small ears and limbs and seal which have a thick a layer of fat below their skin this i am winding up this video thank you in the next video we will be discussing about population and population factors